Well, Dawn Quarry, DQ. Dawn, I first got a taste of you at the 68th Olympic Games in Mexico City. Uh, you were supposed to be a reserve on the team. And uh, well, how old were you then? I was 17 years old when I made my first Olympics. And unfortunately, I had an injury in practice days before the game started. And so I was unable to compete in the relay. Well, your birthday is the 25th of February, 1951. Yes. Would you believe my brother's birthday is the 25th of February, 1952? <laughs> exactly. Okay. Uh, a year different. Well, he did yeah. the trickle jump. He did oh, the okay. trickle jump. Now, going forward from that, <laughs> I know of you at the Drake Relays. At the Drake Relays, it may have been, uh, I can't remember when, but it was at the Drake Relays. And uh, how did you get to Nebraska? Well, I was recruited by quite a few schools and there were past students, athletes, Olympians that went to Nebraska and they recruited me heavily. And I liked the photos I saw, spoke with the coach briefly and I figured I would go to Nebraska. The only problem was when I got to Nebraska, it was about 60 something degrees and I couldn't believe it. <laughs> and they told me, oh, this is nothing. It will get colder. And let me tell you, it did get colder. And I enjoyed being at Nebraska. I thought it was a part of my life that made me mature quickly because there were, I was, it was the first time I, I was on my own. I had friends there, other athletes, and my good friend at Nebraska, who's still my good friend now, Leighton Priestley, we both stuck together and made it through. But I had minor injuries from time to time because of the cold weather. That was one of the problems I had with Nebraska. And after that season, I decided I wanted to leave. And I left and went to California, nice warm weather and Things worked out quite well for me in California. Oh, that is great. But I think you made a show at the Commonwealth Games, 1970. Tell us about yeah. that, the one and the two gold medals. That summer, we went on a tour of Europe. Herb McKinley took a group of us to Europe. And that made a big difference because we had about maybe six meets prior to the Commonwealth Games. And the conditions were favorable, sometimes a little cool, but I was able to adjust. Being, having gone through the cold weather in Nebraska, I was able to adjust. But one of the funny things that on that tour was, I remember we stayed up until very late watching the World Cup football, which Brazil won. And we woke up the next, we were woken up the next morning by Mr. McKinley saying, we have to go. I said, I thought it was tomorrow. He said, no, the meet is today. We had slept for maybe three, four hours. And then we had to drive for about another two hours. I got to the meet, warmed up in the parking lot, went out, ran well, because it's one of those things where I have to do well. And got back to the hotel that evening and I slept for maybe about 10, 12 hours because I was tired and sleepy. But those are the things that made me realize that I had to dig down and compete. It was not a sense that, oh, we are here late. I am tired. So it did help. 
So going into the Commonwealth Games, I had quite a few meets behind me and having to do the rounds, which was something that I enjoyed because each round I ran, I got better. And the final of that hundred, it was cold, but that was never something that was on my mind. By the time I ran the hundred, I was more ready for the 200. And I was just determined that I'm going to run to the best of my ability. It was never a question of I had to win. It was a question of push it, do the best you can. And I was successful. Well, you know, the first time that I saw you run was at the CAC Championships. The first time the Bahamas went to the CAC Championships in 1971. Now, tell me, let me say this. How was your time with the Trojans? So, Mikhail. Going to USC, I, I was, would say I benefit a lot, a lot. The coaches were very inspirational. They guided me quite well academically and on the track. And I, I had good support from my good friend, the late Lennox Miller, who yes, yes. encouraged me, motivated me. We were competitors, but he was a great friend. And that made a big difference because when you have someone who encourages you, even though they're in your event, it meant a lot. And I'd met Lennox from in 68 in Jamaica and our relationship continued right through. And that was a major, major inspirational part for me for that first year going into California. And being at USC was a big difference. But let me tell you this. Uh, you know, Tim Barrett went to uh, Southern California. And he says that he was given the opportunity to uh, uh, recruit uh, the one or uh James. But since with the connection with Southern Cal, I thought that my son should have gone to Southern Cal. Now, unfortunately, uh, he uh, was knocked down in the street and all that kind of thing. And when I was at the Olympic Games, uh, as, I, as I walked through the place and saw the statue with uh, some of the Trojans, uh, I could never forget that. Tell us a little bit about the uh, Pan Am um, in Cali, Pan Am Games in Cali. That was a very interesting meet because we had competed, I had competed in the US Championships, then I competed in the CSC Championships in Jamaica. Going into Cali, I decided once I got there that I needed to rest more than train. Although the coaches wanted me to train and I literally had to say to them, I need three, four days just to recover and get back into what I know is best for my body. Running the 100 was a touch and go. I could win, I could come second, I could come third. But then again, my focus was to do your best, to do what you have been training for. Get out there, push it, and hope you can get to that finish line first. I was able to win the 100, and it gave me more confidence for the 200. In the 200, I had a fantastic start. It was one of those starts which I get now and then because my start was never the top in the top area in, in, in sprinting. I, I always ran on. In fact, my good friend Ernest 
who may be listening, he always gets a <laughs> I try to start like Ernest. But I never have a start like Ernest because Ernest is Ernest. <laughs> and I think once I ran the curve and I covered my competitors, the norm for me is once you get to the straightaway is just to take off. And I just kept running and I was surprised when I ran that fast on the 20 seconds and happy. And I can remember the steps I took while running that race. It was at night, but I was so well focused on duplicating each stride one after the other. And it was a enjoyable Pan Am Games for me. And we went on to win the four by one relay afterwards. So let's move to 72, the Munich Olympics. Tell us about that, Don. Unfortunately, after having a, such a wonderful year in 1971, before the Munich Games, I had a slight injury on my right leg, I think, yes. But it was minimal. Once we got to the Games, we had quite a few days to prepare. Training went well. And unfortunately, in the 200, midway around the curve, I felt something and I kept going. After a few steps, something went, I heard a pop and that was the end of my Olympics in Munich. Well, in between Munich and Montreal, any significant things happen in between the time and then we're going to concentrate on one you all. I had uh, uh, 73 was favorable. I went on 74, had another very good year, I would say. And 75 was my most productive year from a performance level and also my focus in 75 was to do so well that 76 would take the pressure off me because then I would be more centered in duplicating some of the things I did in 75 along with other preparation that I may, preparations that I may need to do. So with the confidence level in 76, was based on my performances in 75 because I never ran that many races in 76 leading up to the games. But my training went extremely well. And by then I was being coached by Leo Davis who didn't have that much to do with track and field. In fact, Leo was a tennis player in Jamaica, but he studied, he learned a lot about track and field. I still had my close friends around to support me. Um, so in 76, I would say, how many? I ran very few races going into Montreal, now that I can remember, because a few people were saying, how come you haven't ran that many? But I ran a lot of relays that year, and I found that the relays got me more prepared. And at the same time, there was no pressure in running relays but it got me ready quickly. And we had a team, we had a decent team, but we were a team and we were able to compete with the best in the world as far as the relay was concerned. And those guys also gave me the support. They were confident that I could do, would do well at, in the games. And Leo, as I said, he was there to guide to pick up on the little areas that we need to refine. And I went into Montreal knowing that I would do well. Hazley won the 100. I was very happy for Hazley. 
because we were friends from 1970. And it does, it Donald, didn't matter. Donald, Excuse let me, me say something. I have a friend who I worked with, and uh, I was telling him what was going to happen with Hazley uh, in Montreal. And he says, obvious. There's no 60 meters in the Olympics. Uh, we had the opportunity to have a clean sweep in Montreal. Hazley in the 100 meters, you in the 200 meters, and the one and only Alberto Juan Torino in the 400 and 800 meters. But I'll tell you this, um, it was a sweep. And with that in mind, we had invited the three of y'all to come to the Bahamas in 1977. And as it happened, Crawford didn't come, Monterino didn't come, but you were there. And I could always remember uh, when we had a cocktail uh, reception for you uh, in the Bahamas. Tell me now if we could move on to Moscow, 1980. 1980 was more of a mental preparation. Unfortunately, I had an accident. I got rear-ended on the freeway in 1979, and my sciatic bothered me for the entire year. I could not come out of the blocks without pain. So most of my sprinting was from a standing position. I competed, but it was a slow buildup. So I went into Moscow with hope. I didn't make the final in the 100 meters. And what helped was running the two rounds did get me going for a while. So by the time the 200 came, I started wondering, will I do well? To skip forward, I got into the final in lane four. I looked around, I saw Sylvia Leonard, Pietro Menea, Alan Wells, and I said, there are three medals and there are four of us here. I have to get one. <laughs> that, that's all I said. And the gun went and I took off. Now bear in mind, my time before that final was, I think maybe 20 point high, something, but I was, my last race was like 20.8. In fact, in the semifinal, I may have ran 20.8 somewhere around there. So I knew I had to run. I didn't have the early speed that I normally would have. But I must say this, I remember coming around the curve and I saw Alan and Pietro moving and they were still ahead of me, which I'm accustomed to beating them around the curve, but I wasn't there and I took off. And all I did was to use my expertise, my, my, my knowledge of focus, focusing on what you're doing, duplicating every stride. The only mistake I made was 10 meters out, I started leaning, which is something I didn't do. But that was because of lack of confidence going into the race. And I barely beat Sylvia Leonard because I was ahead of him, but by leaning so early, he came right back on me, but I managed to get that bronze medal and I was extremely happy. I was also extremely happy for Pietro because he had been to quite a few Olympics and he was my one of my main competitors during my career. And I was happy for myself, but also happy for him. And Alan was new to the scene. So it was, uh, although I was third, it was still a happy moment that I was able to get on the podium and receive a medal. Well, that's fantastic, Don. Um, four years later, 
uh, were you able to participate in the uh, the first World Championships? I got injured two days before. I was training, and I, I, I injured my hamstring. So I never actually participated. Well, uh, Don, you sound similar to the one and only Thomas Augustus Robinson. Because he had some, some leg challenges. Um, so the 84 games. In LA. I didn't hear you. Oh, 84. 84. I only got ready for 84 because it was in Los Angeles. I figured I've been in LA for all these years. Yeah, it's not a bad idea if I give it a shot. I got there, made it to the semifinal, missed out on the final, was not very disappointed because I wanted to, part wanted to participate. It would have been good to have made the final, but then came the relay. Unfortunately, we had lane one, and I told the young men, all of them were much younger than I was. I said, each round that we ran on, in during the games, I said, run this as a final. We have to run hard each time so that we can get used to each other with the handoffs. Because going into the, the Olympics, the relay team was not based on our performances before. And I thought once the gun went, we were in good contention. I received the baton and I just did what I had to do, which was to run as hard as I could around the curve and got it to the anchor person who was able to hold on and we were able to come up with a silver medal. Well, that is, that is great. Any other, tell us about uh, towards your retirement, um, how did that work? Well, once I decided that I would not compete anymore, I of course kept myself in good shape and I started doing coaching clinics, coaching seminars internationally. And it was good because I was able to stay in contact with most of the people that I knew while competing, some of them were athletes, some were coaches, some were meet directors. And that has kept me motivated. It has kept me alive in terms of focusing on what I need to do for me in terms of staying healthy and what I can do and will always do to assist young upcoming athletes, either advising them or coaching because I think that so it's very important. The question is, um, just tell us a little bit about your best coaches and then tell us about uh, the athletes that you participated with, how the not how they see you now, but you keep in contact. And I just wanted to mention one of them was Jerry Wisdom. Jerry Wisdom. Okay. I, I had outstanding coaches from in high school. One of the good things about the coaches I've had was they communic communicated with me very well. I was very receptive and it made a big difference in terms of how I was able to trust what they were passing on to me. It, there was never any dispute as to what I should or should not do because we are always discussing what we need to do. In fact, with most of my coaches, I would say that during my workouts, I could tell them exactly what I did wrong or right, and they would be thinking the exact same thing. They were looking at what I was doing. I was feeling what I was doing. So we were always on the right page. 
to get things done. In terms of support outside of coaching, as I mentioned, the late Lennox Miller, and I'll also mention uh, Herb McKinley. Herb was an inspirational person with his stories. He gave us stories about his past, about his history. Whenever you're on a team, you never get bored, you get more motivated for Mr. McKinley. And that was a very, very important factor to the team and all the teams that I was able to be on with him. As you mentioned also, I came to Bahamas and I had met Jerry before when I was at Nebraska. I think it was at the Texas Relays, I'm almost sure. And he came down and we spoke for a while and the relationship started building up more once I came to Bahamas and Neville, I still keep in touch with Neville. And I think it's important when you have friends who are friends, not because of what you have accomplished, but because of the relationship, the, the, the chemistry that you develop as athletes, as individuals, and as part of life. Lifelong friends are very important, even though you may not communicate with them very often, when you do, it's special. And those are the memories that I carry with me. Those are the memories that are important. And I think it's something that helped me along my daily life from day one until now. My family, Why? most of all, I would say, made a big difference in my career. And it's all about relationship in track and field. Well, Don, family time. Can you hear me? Tell us about your family time. Well, I have two daughters. Uh, they didn't have an idea what I did. In fact, my youngest used her, one of her favorite thing with her aunt was when she told her that, oh, your dad ran well. He, he, he was very fast. He's just as famous as they were mentioned in someone on the TV. And she looked at her and she said, no, he's not. He's just my dad. <laughs> because I never, in fact, they didn't even know I won Olympics or saw my medal until at school, a friend of ours had a presentation, Black History Month, and asked me if I would you know, speak to the kids. That was the first time my, my daughters saw my medal or knew much about my athletics. And they were, I think, in junior high. Nevertheless, I never encouraged them to be athletes because I did. I wanted them to do a sport. I wanted them to experience more than just studying. And the fact that I had a little knowledge, I told them I have a little knowledge in track and field. <laughs> I did volunteer at their high school and coached them during that period. And it was fun because they were one of the athletes. I never gave them any special treatment. And we never, in fact, my daughter once told me, she did something at home and I told her, I said, okay, well, tomorrow when we go to practice, she said, dad, remember you said, once we are at the track, you're the coach. And once you're here, you're the dad. And they call me coach outside at the track. Hmm. So we were able to separate that and it made a world of a difference at home and my wife now Yolanda always said I'm staying out of this whenever it came to track and field she supported it but she allowed me to do what I may have to do now and then now and then you know I said we need to do a Saturday run and I think I'm almost thought I always said I thought you guys planned this oh dad we're supposed to go shopping with mom <laughs> So there goes the Saturday morning run. But I allow them to be themselves. 
And I love them. I admire them for the way they have developed and the way my wife has raised, both of us have raised them. And it's always important that you can share the joy of what you have achieved with friends and especially family, immediate family, aunts, brothers, sisters, it's very important. My, my mother was my greatest supporter. In high school, if I told her I had to wake up at six to go and run, even though I may stay up late that night, she showed no mercy. She would wake us up. Remember you said you're getting up to go and run. And those are the things that I cherish. I know that having met my wife from in college, she had no idea that I ran. She used to wonder, why is he out there on the track every day? <laughs> but eventually she understood what track and field was. She was very inspirational in um, my career because we met early. We got married in same time. So we dated for quite a while, but it was still a positive relationship. And also, I think she saw what I did. She enjoyed what I did. She knows all my friends. And at the same time now, you've met her, Ernest knows her. The girls, when I speak about anyone, they can relate to it. They knew who all the individuals, individuals were in my athletic career, in my time as an athlete and after. The important factor for me is looking at track and field and see, seeing where it's going now. It's positive. The leadership from the top, the IWF, is moving in a good direction. Unfortunately, this is 2021, we're going through a pandemic, but I'm sure in a few years, track and field will get back to that height that we so well deserve. Because when you look at sprinting, for example, every sport, you have to run. So quickness, speed is always important in every aspect of sport. I well, am looking forward to the Olympics this year and hoping that after this we can have more outstanding performances on during the year of the Olympics that it is designated for, because this will be an unusual one in 2021. Thank you so much, Donald Quarry D. Hume. Uh, and uh, I really appreciated you being one of my guests, a track and field legend. Thank you ever so much. Thank you, Alphys, for having me. And let's hope everything works out well for the Olympics coming up. Thank you. Thank you.